Today I'm here to talk about the fragmentation and the reassembly, the frame delivery modes and fragment forwarding. Again, I will I will try and I will go actually to the uh, bytes and bits uh, level of the, during this talk. So I hope that um, you will be able to follow me. And if not, please uh, ask questions anytime. So uh, my name is again Georgios Papadopoulos. I am an associate professor at the engineering school at IMT Atlantique in the campus of Rennes in France. And uh, a few words about my teaching and research interests. Uh, they span in the area of industrial IoT networks, on deterministic networking, on smart grid and metering, on battery management systems for electrical vehicles, and on uh, integrated access and backhaul for 5G networks. So, um, considering that we have seen the IPv6 and UDP headers compression uh, of the 6 one in our previous webinar talk, in this talk we are going uh, to see the following three features of 6 one <clears throat> So first, we will start with uh, IPv6 uh, packet per hop fragmentation and reassembly operations. Uh, then we will be uh, we will continue with the two frame delivery modes, the mesh under and the root over. Then in the section three or chapter three, uh, it is dedicated to the uh, issues that root over and per hop fragmentation and reassembly mode may potentially have. And finally, I will conclude this talk with the latest standard on Cixlopan, which was published in 2020. Uh, and is an alternate approach to per hop uh, fragmentation and reassembly. Uh, and it's called 6 lopan fragment forwarding 6LFF, whereby an intermediate node forwards and fragment without reassembly. Uh, I will proceed now with the uh, first chapter on 6 lopan per hop fragmentation and reassembly. Now, as specified in the RFC 4944, when a compressed IPv6 datagram does not fit within a single IEEE 800.215.4 MTU, so MTU stands for uh, maximum transmission unit, so in this case is 127 bytes, then fragmentation operation is required to split the large uh, IPv6 datagrams into multiple uh, link layer fragments where each of them is equal to um, 127 bytes. Now, let us dive deeper to see the whole process of 6 lopan fragmentation and reassembly operation that was defined in RFC 4944. In order to enable fragmentation and reassembly operations, 6 lopan defines two fragment headers where the header for the first fragment consists of four bytes, while the header for the subsequent fragments of five bytes. More specifically, the fragment headers come with the following fields. First, we have the datagram size. This first field is employed to encode the size of the original IPv6. Uh, datagram or packet. Then we have the second field, uh, which is the datagram tag. Now, this field in conjunction with the MAC source address is employed to identify all link layer fragments of a single IPv6 datagram. Okay, so we have an IPv6 datagram that is split into n number of fragments, and we use the datagram tag to identify all these n fragments of a specific IPv6 datagram. Now, the third field, which is the last field in the datagram, uh, in the header, excuse me, is the datagram offset. Now, this field is included only in the second and subsequent link layer fragments of an IPv6 packet, and it specifies the offset in increments of eight bytes. Let's go more to the details. In other words, it identifies the relative position of the received link layer fragment from the beginning of the payload datagram. What does it mean? It means that 
the IPv6 packet is split it into multiple fragments. And these fragments from the source node are uh, transmitted to the destination. And at the receiver side, since the fragments may arrive out of sequence, we are going to use this datagram offset field in order to place the received fragment again to the um, uh, to the original position before the fragmentation actually. So actually, what does it mean? It means that this field of telegram offset allows us to have out of sequence delivery of the fragments. Here we have the fragmentation type and header format for the first link layer fragment, where the first five bits of dispatch value bit pattern indicates that fragmentation type. In this case, it is equal to 11000, so five bits, and it represents the first fragment of an IPv6 telegram. While the, uh, in the figure below, the first, uh, the first five bits uh, is equal to 11100, and it represents uh, either the second or subsequent fragment of an IPv6 telegram. Now, the receiving node, upon receipt of a, of a link layer fragment, it initiates the reassembly operation to reconstruct the original unfragmented IPv6 telegram whose size is equal to telegram size. Toward this aim, the receiver checks first the telegram tag field to identify all fragments that belong to a given IPv6 telegram. Next, it checks the telegram offset to determine the location of the received individual fragment within the original unfragmented uh, telegram. Finally, the receiver checks the datagram size field to identify the size of the original unfragmented datagram and consequently the size of the reassembly buffer. Why? Because we definitely need uh, a buffer to place temporarily these fragments until we are done with the reassembly procedure of each IPv6 uh, datagram. Furthermore, once uh, the receiver successfully receives uh, a new link layer fragment within uh, with a certain telegram tag, it will initiate what it's called a reassembly timer. Now, the value of this reassembly uh, timer or the timeout must be configured to a maximum of 60 seconds, which is the timeout of um, the IPv6 reassembly procedure. Now, if the IPv6 telegram has not been reconstructed within this time, meaning within the 60 seconds, the reassembly operation is aborted while the received fragment are discarded. So this is how the six lopan uh, fragmentation and the reassembly procedure from the source to the destination works, okay? So this was the first part uh, of the six lopan um, adaptation layer. And now we'll proceed to six lopan frame delivery mode. Uh, in six lopan, well, six lopan defines two frame delivery modes. First, we have the mesh under, and then we have the root over or per hop fragmentation and reassembly mode. Now, both approaches, meaning mesh under and root over, are widely employed in the smart grid and metering networks around the world. Okay, so it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. They're just two different approaches, and both of them are, um, yeah, both of them are deployed already and operating. Are, are are and they are using these two approaches in their the industrial I mean and the operators in their uh, smart grid and metering networks. Now, the first mode takes place, I'm talking about the mesh under, takes place at the six lopan adaptation layer where the nodes require the knowledge of the roots at layer two based on MAC. 
whereas the second mode does it at the layer three based on IP. Now, let's go uh, deeper to see in detail the uh, these two modes. Now, as previously mentioned, in the mesh under mode, the routing and forwarding operations are performed at six pan adaptation layer based on layer two addresses. And thus the IPv6 header does not need to be unpacked. Indeed, the network layer assumes that all nodes share the same prefix, where multiple link layer hops, meaning layer two, may be employed to complete a single IP hop. To forward the received fragment to its destination in mesh under mode, the node requires uh, knowing its address, uh, which is defined here, the final destination address. And furthermore, in order to perform the reassembly operation, which is done only at the destination node, be careful, at the destination node and not at each intermediate one, the node requires knowing the address of the original source, what is called in this uh, uh, RFC 4944 standard, the originator address. Considering that at each forwarding step, the link layer destination and source addresses are overwritten by the addresses of the next hop and by the node performing the forwarding. This, inform this information regarding the final destination address and the originator address needs to be stored somewhere else. Towards the same, Sixlopan defines the mesh header in RFC 4944 where one and zero are the first two bits. In addition to the addresses, the uh, originator address and the final address, the mesh header stores layer two equivalent of an IPv6 hop limit, which is called hops left. This value must be decremented by a forwarding node before sending the frame on its next hop. Now, if the value reaches zero, the frame is discarded silently. Finally, the mesh header defines the V and F bits that indicate whether the originator or very first address and the final destination address respectively are 16 bits short or 64 bits EUI64 addresses. Let's take an example to see how it works. Let's assume now that uh, the node S uses the mesh under approach to deliver a frame, and we have the node D that is the destination in this uh, small example. Then uh, the node, it must include a mesh addressing header with the originator's link layer address set to its own which means in this case S, and the final destination uh, destination's uh, link layer address set to the frame's ultimate destination. In this case is the node uh, D. So we have S and D as the two uh, addresses at the uh, six lopan uh, mesh header. Furthermore, it sets in the layer two, so we are in the MAC layer now, layer two headers, source address fields, its own link layer address, and it includes the forwarders, which means in this case, the node B, link layer address in the layer two headers, destination address field. Okay, so what we have here, we have the layer two with S and B, so the uh, source and the forwarding addresses, MAC addresses. And we have the very first source, which is again in this case S, and the very final destination in this case is the D at the six lopan mesh header. Similarly, when uh, a forwarding node receives uh, a frame, in this case the node B, it will check the mesh addressing header uh, final address field to determine the final destination according to the following three options. If the node itself 
is the final destination, it will initiate the reassembly of the IPv6 packet. If it is not the final destination, the node then reduces the hops left field. And if it is result is zero, it discards the frame. Otherwise, the node consults its link layer routing table, determines the next hop toward the final destination, and sets that layer two address in the destination address field of the layer two header. Finally, the node changes the layer two header's source address to its own link layer address and it transmits the frame. As you can see, we have the, uh, the mesh header remains the same, so S and D are unchanged, while hop by hop we are changing the, uh, the source and the destination between the two um, relay nodes, so which is the layer two in this case. Now, these operations are performed for each frame in each intermediate node before an IPv6 packet reaches its destination, okay? Now, the second approach of six Lopan frame delivery is called the root over or per hop fragmentation and reassembly mode, where the routing and forwarding tasks are executed at the network layer, the layer three, based on IP. Therefore, in root over operation or root over mode, each link layer hop is an IP hop. In a root over six Lopan network, the received fragments of the same IPv6 fragmented packet are expected to be first reassembled at each intermediate node and then decompressed to reconstruct the original IPv6 packet, pushed to layer three to be routed, uh, to be routed uh, according to the routing protocol, such as the uh, Ripple. Ripple is this layer here, as you can see, RPL, we call it Ripple at the ITF. And then compressed, and fragmented again before being forwarded to the next hop. So you see what happens here is that at each uh, relay node, the, uh, the IPv6 packet is reassembled at the layer three and then fragmented again through the six Lopan layer before forwarded uh, fragment by fragment to the next hop. Let's take an example to see here how the root over works and considering again the same topology where the node S is the source node and the node D is the destination. The fragmented IPv6 packet is transmitted to the next hop node B based on the IPv6 header and the routing protocol that is running on top. As I said before, we can use in this example the routing protocol RPL, repo. Upon the reception of the first fragment, node B employs the incoming reassembly buffer to, uh, to store the received fragment, okay? And it initiates the, reass the, the reassembly and decompression operations to reconstruct the original unfragmented IPv6 packet. Then contrary to the mesh under mode, it will pass the original packet to the layer three in order to check the IPv6 original source and final destination headers. If node B is not the final destination, it will push down to the six Lopan layer again to compress and fragmentation operations again. Finally, based on its layer three routing table, it will forward the packet to the next hop, which is the node F in this example. Again, the same procedure will take place in the rest of the path until the final destination is reached. So the, the IPv6 packet uh, 
uh, reassembly will take place at the layer 6 Lopin, uh, the node F. It will push again this, um, the packet up to the layer 3 to, to read the destination and the source IPv6 addresses, and it will be pushed down to the 6 Lopin layer again. This is the yellow color that you see here for compression and potentially fragmentation purposes and it will be forward to the next hop, which is the uh, node D in this case. I will proceed now to the chapter three, where we are going to detail uh, the issues when root over mode is employed. Now, six Lopan employs a frame delivery mechanism that is ill-suited for a six Lopan root over mode where the reassembly and fragmentation of the entire IPv6 packet is required at every IPv6 hop along the multi-hop path. Now, in the following, we are going to see the issues related to the 6 lopan per hop fragmentation and reassembly approach. So first, we have the issue in terms of the uh, network reliability. Now, when a node receives the first fragment of a certain IPv6 packet, as I said previously, it will initiate the reassembly timer, which is typ typically set to a uh, maximum of 60 seconds. Okay. Now, if all fragments are not received during this reassembly period, then the reassembly of the datagram is not possible. What does it mean? It means that the received fragments being discarded from the incoming reassembly buffer. Now, note that if even one fragment is missing, the receiver cannot proceed with the reassembly operation. So it means that if I have an IPv6 um, packet that is fragmented to eight fragments, uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, proceed with the uh, reassembly operation if even one fragment out of the eight will be missing. The next issue here is that we have the latency issue. Indeed, the uh, reassembly operation at each hop significantly increases the end-to-end -end delay. Plus, we have to consider that we have additional computation time for uh, fragment. Uh, again, the previously reassembled IPv6 packets. So we, are ha we have to do at each relay node the same procedure. You see the uh, reassembly of the fragments, and then we have to uh, fragment again the previously reassembled IPv6 packet, which introduces uh, additional computational time. And as a result, what happens is that the more hops you see here we have for order one for order two so the more hops we have in the path uh towards the destination the higher is the end-to-end -end delay end-to-end -end means from the source to the destination next uh, we have the fragmentation process which introduces inefficient resource usage since it requires large incoming reassembly buffers at the forwarding node. In fact, to proceed with complete reassembly at each hop, a relay node may require 1,280 bytes or more of buffer space when considering the IPv6 datagrams. Now, Considering that uh, sensor devices are extremely constrained in terms of memory, it will be possible to reassemble only very few uh, complete IPv6 packets. Let's see here um, an example. Therefore, when we have uh, several consecutive datagrams in the wireless multi-hop network, so in this case, let's assume that we have the node B, which is the, uh, the receiver, and what does it mean? It means that it has the incoming reassembly buffer. And then we have the two devices, A and C, that are sending the, uh, the fragments. So in this case, the node A is transmitting the seventh fragment of the uh, IPv6 datagram uh, 
uh, from the node A. And then on the other side, we have the first fragment of an IPv6 datagram that, in, that is initiated from the node C. So here what happens is that given several consecutive datagrams in this wireless, let's assume multi-hop, even though in this case you can see only the one hop uh, part of the large network, an ongoing reassembled datagram A, so in this case you see here we have the reassembly of the datagram uh, IPv6 datagram from the node A. So you see that we have already received the first six fragments and the node B is expecting to receive the seventh uh, fragment from the node uh, C. What will happen is that um, the ongoing reassembled datagram A may be discarded when a new fragment of datagram C is received. So in this case, when the uh, the datagram um, the first datagram the first fragment of datagram C is received, while previous datagram A has not yet entirely been uh, reassembled. So what why we have this problem? Simply because uh, the node B, the uh, the receiver, doesn't have enough memory, enough uh, bytes, buffer, in, uh, yeah, in, enough bytes in its buffer to buffer second or third or fourth IPv6 datagrams. Because we have to consider that for each reassembly, uh, for each IPv6 packet reassembly, the node B should dedicate a specific uh, memory in terms of byte in its um, in its memory, uh, depending the datagram. Uh, if you remember datagram size that I spoke, you remember datagram tag, datagram size, and datagram uh, uh, yeah, uh, datagram size tag. I don't remember the third one. So by using the datagram size, the node B will uh, will allocate uh, this uh, dedicated uh, IPv6 size in its buffer. So the more uh, IPv6 packets are arriving to the destination, the more is more dangerous that we will have these uh, issues regarding the resource usage. Now, what happens is that such issues will introduce more losses in the multi-hop network. Uh, and finally, the uh, fourth issue that I'm going to present here is in terms of the implementation point of view. Now, according to the RFC 49-44, only, the, unfortunately, and, and, and I do not see if we can solve this problem, only the first fragment of the IPv6 data, data packet contains the source and destination IPv6 addresses while the following fragments are rooted based on the datagram tag, okay? So uh, only the first fragment uses the uh, IPv6 packets, source and destination, uh, while all the subsequent fragments are forwarded or rooted based on this datagram tag value that is introduced by the RFC 4944. Now, this datagram tag, uh, field is misleading because the the value actually the tag is unique only to the six lopan original source and final destination nodes. As a result, what happens is that two different traffic flows may be tagged with the same value, which could introduce implementation issues during the storing of the fragment forwarding state. So for example, in this case, we have two different traffic flows in this multi-hop network traversing through the nodes uh, A and B. So we have the, the traffic flow blue and the traffic flow uh, yellow-orange color. And they are going through the node A and B. What may happen is that the nodes uh, um, uh, the nodes, the, I mean, the source nodes of each of these traffic flows may label with the same datagram 
tag uh, value during the fragmentation operation. So basically it means that the node A, the source of this fragmentation process, may select uh, arbitrary because there is no uh, a rule how each device selecting the value for the datagram tag in the 6 one the value 5. Similarly, there is this high probability that the node B may select exactly the same uh, value for each datagram tag field. So what will happen is that when these uh, uh, fragments are, uh, are, are, are traversing the multi-hop network and they will eventually will arrive to the common node which is called uh, in this case uh, node m and then the node m will uh, forward that this uh, these fragments to this uh, common node c and in this case the node c will be the confused node it means that it doesn't know to which next hop to forward the fragments to why because the node uh, c receives as you can see here uh, uh, the fragments so we do not know about anything about the ipv6 uh, source and the destination we only know the telegram tag and by receiving exactly the same telegram tag this node c doesn't know where to forward whether to node x or to y okay because as i said earlier the second or subsequent fragments are forwarded based on telegram tag value and not based on the APV6. Uh, yep. Now I will proceed in this uh, uh, chapter four, which is my last chapter in this talk, and I will show you how this uh, new RFC uh, solves the problem of the previously presented even the last uh, issue re related to the datagram tax. Now, uh, the 6 uh, fragment forwarding or 6LFF is uh, an alternate approach to per hop fragmentation and reassembly. Now, the idea here is that the nodes uh, will, I mean the nodes, I mean the intermediate nodes, in this case the node B, uh, will forward a fragment without reassembly, which means that the routing decision is made on the first fragment of the IPv6 packet. Now, considering that the uh, IPv6 uh, header, um, uh, considering that the first uh, fragment uh, carries the IPv6 uh, header, which means the source and the destination addresses, uh, the first fragment will be forwarded immediately. And what will happen is that uh, some states, let's say some information, will, uh, will be kept on the intermediate nodes in order to enable forwarding the subsequent fragments along the path uh, towards the destination. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm coming with the details in the in a while. So basically what happens is that the node A sends the first fragment, which contains the information regarding the source and destination of IPv6 uh, addresses. And when the node B will receive this first fragment, instead of waiting for the rest of the fragments to be received uh, in order to do reassembly and then to fragment again before sending to the next hop, which is the R in this case, the node B, whatever, whenever it will receives, it will check the header of the IPv6. It will uh, keep some information here. We are going to discuss right after, and it will immediately forward this fragment to the next hop. So I think you can imagine already that we are gaining, if you remember, this 60 seconds uh, regarding the reassembly procedure. Now, let us. Uh, dive deeper to see the whole process of the 6 one forwarding. Now, 6LFF was published in November of 2020, and it is defined in RFC 8930. The core idea of 6LFF is when receiving the first fragment of an IPv6 packet, 
the intermediate node, the node B, will decompress the IPv6 uh, header. So if you remember in our previous webinar talk, we talked about the compression and the decompression. So this is the, uh, the compressed uh, IPv6 header. It will determine, so it means that it did the decompression. Now we, here we have the uh, original IPv6 header. And as you can see, we have all the information that we need, the source and destination address. So the intermediate node will uh, determine the next hop according to the destination uh, IPv6 address that is included in the first fragment, be careful. And then it will forward uh, this, uh, this received fragment immediately to that, uh, to that neighbor, meaning to the one that was uh, indicated in the um, IPv6 header in the destination address field. While doing that, it will keep some information as we said in uh, locally. So in this case, as you can see, we have the use actually of the datagram tag. And in this example, let's assume that the datagram tag is equal to 23. So eventually what we have is that the first fragment I'm trying to summarize here, is sent from A to node B. The node B decompressed the first fragment, detected the uh, destination IPv6 address. It uh, kept the information regarding the datagram tag uh, for this uh, fragment, and it immediately sent this fragment to the destination. So you see that we do not have any more what we called before hop fragmentation and reassembly while here we have fragment forwarding that's why it's called 6lff now when receiving the subsequent fragment so i'm talking about the the node b uh, of the same ipv6 packet so let's say that here we have the uh, fragment four and the fourth fragment which have the same datagram tag the 23 the node, the intermediate node, the node B here, will forward these fragments immediately to the next hop. So what happens here is that we have uh, uh, for the whatever for the second and subsequent fragments, every time that the fragment is arrived to this intermediate node, it will check the datagram tag from the uh, six lopan uh, header mesh header. And it will forward if it, uh, it's equal to the, the one that is in this case 23, it will forward directly to the destination. Now, once all the fragments have successfully arrived at the uh, final destination, only then the IPv6 packet will be reassembled. So here we assume that the node A sent all eight fragments to the uh, next hop and the node B, which is the next hop, forwarded all of them based on the datagram tag to the final destination. The node R, which is the, uh, the reassembly node, received all these eight fragments and make the reassembled, the reassembly of the IPv6 packet. Now, to do whatever I presented previously, so this 6LFF operation, uh, 6LFF introduces what is called virtual reassembly buffer or VRB for short. It is a technique, technique that can be implemented without changing the RFC 4944. You see what does it mean is that we have backward compatibility. So it is very similar to a switching table. Each intermediate node maintains a VRB table in which the entries correspond to IPv6 packets in the process of being forwarded. So as you can see here, we have a table. This is the table, VRB table of the node B, and each entry uh, it's dedicated for one IPv6 packet. In the beginning, all VRB tables of all nodes are empty though they do have uh, a maximum pre-allocated memory. 
Now, each VRB entry is a tuple of four elements. We have the link layer address of the previous hop, so in this case uh, of the node A. The locally unique datagram tag, so here is the uh, the value of the diagram tag. Link layer address of the next hop. So in this case will be uh, uh, R. And the locally unique diagram tag for the outgoing fragment. Okay. So I'm going to explain a little bit this part. If you remember, I uh, talked about the uh, datagram tag issue that there is a collision because there is a high probability that two nodes may select exactly the same uh, diagram tags. Now, in order to solve this problem, this uh, RFC 4930 and the VRB uh, technique, what, what they are doing is it, what they are doing is that at each intermediate node, the devices will are going to swap the value of this uh, tag. So in this case, for instance, if the node A will send a fragment with datagram tag equal to uh, 12, for instance, then the node B, uh, so here in this part will be the number, uh, the value 12, then the node B, before sending this fragment to the next hop, it will swap this value to 23, for instance, in order to guarantee that if there will be two values of 12 at the outgoing column, we will have two different tag values. So like this, we are avoiding this uh, implementation issue related to the tags. I think I have an example later and we will see how it, how it works. Now, assuming that we have a 64-bit link layer addresses and 16-bit datagram tags, now one VRB entry will require uh, a memory of 20 bytes, okay? So it means that each uh, entry that is dedicated for IPv6 packets will require at the end of the day only 20 bytes, contrary to the RFC 4944, where each entry actually is the size of the IPv6 packet, okay? Now, when an intermediate node receives the first fragment of an IPv6 packet, from a uh, from a neighbor with a datagram tag not registered for that neighbor in VRB table. So here we have the first fragment from the node A, and it comes with datagram tag equal to 23. It will create a new entry in the VRB table, and it will uh, record the link layer address of this previous hop and the datagram tag of the incoming fragment. So as I said previously, it will register here the uh, the link layer address, so the MAC address of the node A, and the datagram tag that it was tagged in the, from the node from the source. So here is the value of uh, 23. Next, the intermediate node will determine the link layer address of the next hop based on the IPv6 address contained in the first datagram, in the first fragment, excuse me. So in this case is the next uh, hop is the R. So it will uh, register the link layer address of the node R. And finally, it will pick a new datagram tag for the outgoing fragment that is unique for the next hop node. So you see here it swaps from 23 to 47 in order to avoid the um, implementation issue when two tags, when two nodes pick exactly the same uh, datagram tag value and they are transmitted to a common intermediate node. Uh, moreover, it will set a timer that allows discarding this uh, stale uh, 6LFF state after some timeout. So it means that after a certain period, this entry will be removed since there is no news in order to be able to accommodate new IPv6 uh, datagrams to forward. <clears throat> then what happens is that all subsequent fragments of the same IPv6 packet will go through the same process. Okay, So we have the same 
process for the fourth, and fifth, sixth, seventh, and the eighth uh, uh, fragments, and they will be forwarded to the next hop by employing this newly created VRB entry. So meaning that now the, from the second and subsequent fragments, they are just using this uh, incoming and outgoing filters to forward to the next hop the fragments. Now, more specifically, the intermediate node of each subsequent fragment will use uh, its source link layer address and datagram tag in the incoming uh, columns of the VRP table and will forward based on the outgoing columns. Okay. Finally, upon forwarding the last fragment, so the eighth fragment here, the node clears the VRB entry from its table in order to accommodate, as I said earlier, uh, new IPv6 telegrams. As a result, the VRB technique allows intermediate nodes, the relay nodes, to immediately forward the received fragments without reassembling the complete IPv6 packet first, which is the case in RFC 4944. Now, a few words about the advantages and disadvantages. So the advantage of employing the RB table and the fragment forwarding scheme over the per hop reassembly are multiple. First, we have the end-to-end -end latency, which should be greatly reduced since the intermediate nodes do not need to uh, reassemble and then fragment again the IPv6 packets before forwarding to the next hop. Next, the end-to-end -end network uh, reliability should be improved since the memory footprint of VRB table is just the VRB table and not the actual size of each IPv6 packet. So we have 20 bytes per entry instead of the actual size of each IPv6 packet, which reduce, reduces, which reduces significantly the fragment drop probability. Uh, furthermore, the datagram tag issue is solved by swapping the tags at each hop instead of having the same globally unique. Now, a few words regarding the uh, drawbacks. Even though 6LFF based on the VRB method overcomes certain issues of per hop fragmentation and reassembly of RFC 4944, it comes with some uh, limitations as well. And the first one is that there is no uh, fragment recovery built in. So in case a single fragment is lost along the uh, multi, multi hop path, then there is no mechanism in 6LFF, be careful, in the RFC 8930 for the, for the node that uh, reassembles an IPv6 packet to request for it. Now here I would like to make a parenthesis and to let you know that we do have uh, a new RFC, which is uh, recently published, is called RFC 49, sorry, RFC 8931, that solves this uh, problem of fragment recovery. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to put this standard here as well to present you, but I hope that I will have uh, an opportunity in the future to talk about this uh, standard as well. Uh, this issue introduces unnecessary traffic in the network since the remaining fragments are forwarded even when the destination node can 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 never reassemble the original IPv6 packet. So moreover, what does it mean? It means that um, it requires the whole IPv6 packet to be resent from the source node. All this simply because we do not have in RFC uh, 8930, the fragment recovery uh, mechanism. Next, 6 pound fragment forwarding does not support per fragment routing. Why? Because only the first fragment contains the IPv6 header and thus the IPv6 destination address, which means that all subsequent fragments must follow the same path toward the destination as the first fragment. As a side effect, is that the first fragment must always be forwarded first. 
Finally, uh, even though each entry reserves a small footprint in the VRB table, there is a probability for a PV6 packet to be dropped. Why? Because the size of the VRB table is necessarily uh, finite. What does it mean? It means that in the extreme case where the number of IPv6 packets concurrently um, traversing an intermediate node is larger than the size of the entries in its uh, VRB table, then IPv6 packets are dropped. To conclude my talk, I want you to remember that 6 Lopan fragment forwarding is an implementation technique, not a new protocol that makes it fully compatible with the per hop fragmentation and reassembly of the original 6 Lopan root over mode of RFC 4944. Uh, that's it uh, regarding my talk. Here I have some information if you want to reach me out, my email, my website, and the channel that I have created recently uh, on YouTube for educational purposes. So I am uploading uh, frequently subjects regarding to IPv6, regarding to uh, 6 Lopan, uh, and Co-op, and all the uh, IETF and IEEE related uh, protocols, and not only. And I have uh, two slides that are uh that i would like to share with you the news regarding the MOOC that is online so uh, me and my colleagues we have uh worked the past two years on a massive uh, online open courses that is called iot communications and networks it is uh, on the you will find this uh this uh, this course on the coursera platform it is launched so you can go there uh create an account on Coursera if you don't have one and uh, start following the, 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 the course. And in this course, you have everything that I said today. So you see the week three of the MOOC is dedicated for IPv6 and 6 Lopan. So the two talks that I gave uh, in this webinar series are within, you will find it in the MOOC in the week three. Then the talk that Pascal Tuber gave and other guys, I assume, uh, regarding the uh, 60-ish, the, uh, the scheduling function and the resource allocation layer, or the TSCH, the MAC layer protocol, or the routing protocol, the Ripple, all of them you will find it in this MOOC. And uh, yeah, this is the educational team. And of course, we try to get some industrials to give their inputs why it is important for the industrials these um, these protocols so for instance we had an interview with Pascal Joubert to discuss and to explain us why it is so important for Cisco the routing protocol we spoke with uh, with an uh, engineer from NEDIS NEDIS is a uh, 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 energy distributor for the smart grid networks in France, and they are using in their networks the six Lopan uh, uh, adaptation layer. And they uh, talked about why they are using six Lopan, why it is necessary for them. And then we spoke with uh, Thomas Vatain from Analog Devices about the importance uh, of the 60s adap adaptation layer and why they are using and how they are using, etc. So that's it from my side. I'm happy to, uh, if we have the time to to have to discuss a little bit to 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 answer your questions if you have any. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Yorgos. Uh, this is absolutely incredible. Uh, any questions? Please raise your hand or. Uh, you, um, you know, you can type them in the in the question window too. Uh, I'm not seeing very many. I was just going to ask you about implementations, and then and then um, uh, you you know you came out with some implementations. I think that's very very good. Is because um, if we can see them live, then then that's wonderful. Um, yeah, this is a fabulous presentation, Yorgos. I'm not I'm not hearing any questions and. And um, um, and surprisingly, I I'm not finding any myself either. 
it was uh, very, very well done. And um, uh, so uh, if, if any of the rest of you have comments, uh, please send them to me offline. I'll go ahead and forward them to Yorgos. Uh, let me thank you again uh, for your presentation. Uh, it was uh, wonderful. It'll be it's recorded, and so we will make that available to everyone. Um, and uh, and I encourage you guys to go ahead and sign up for the MOOC. Uh, I think it's a if you really want to dive in and get to know all the the, the details, that's really the place to go. So thank you again. And we will see you in two weeks, I hope, to talk about EULA addresses uh, for IPv6. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.